Matt, well, over here at the newly renovated RSC Ventures uh, offices. Thanks to my wife, by the way. Yeah, I have to give her credit, a plug credit to Sarah Ricard's Higgins. <laughs> Sarah Higgins plug uh, <laughs> looks amazing in here. My first impressions were Thank you. you knocked it off the charts. I wish you would have seen what it looked like before. <laughs> so Matt, uh, lots of exciting things going on. You're involved in several different businesses. Uh, you know, partnered and co-founded RSC Ventures with Stephen Ross, the owner of the Miami Dolphins. Uh, new addition back on Shark Tank. Uh, lots of exciting things, but I think you know, it was yeah, no pun intended. In case you missed the prop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the more exciting things to me is kind of how you came from humble beginnings and and started your career. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got to where we're at today? Yeah, it's always a hard question to answer, but um, big picture. Grew up in Queens. Uh, grew up, you know, dirt poor. Uh, hustling since a very young age, selling flowers on street corners when I was, you know, 10 years old and hawking leather handbags at the Roosevelt Field Flea Market for $10 on the top of a van with my friend Nazareth. Um, (laughs) So just all those odd jobs. And I had an epiphany very uh, young, uh, around the age of maybe 14. Uh, My mother was disabled and progressively getting worse. Things were desperate, live sleeping on a mattress on a floor and just figured my life could go in a conventional path. I could continue to watch this thing deteriorate um, and uh, things just get worse and worse. Uh, I go to college, wait it out, or I could take extreme measures that were appropriate for the circumstances and um, had this idea that if I could drop out of high school uh, when I was 16, I could get my GD, take my SATs, enroll in college and get a, uh, get a job, a much better job, right? right? At the time, I think I was working at McDonald's making three seventy five an hour, okay. which was there an awesome go. job yeah. actually back then. But, uh, but so that was like one of the first times in my life when I decided to buck convention and do what I knew was right for me under the circumstances. Um, everybody said, you're going to be a loser. Yeah. You're going to have the mark of Cain for the rest of your <laughs> life. You'll yeah. never get a job. Uh, but I kind of figured, you know what? I can clean that up later. And I went for it, dropped out and uh, enrolled in college when I was 16, went back to my prom wow. as president of the debate team. <laughs> I saw my teacher there. I said, how do you like them apples? Uh, <laughs> but that was the first time I really kind of went with my intuition and buck convention. But how did you, I mean, how does one at 16 years old, because I know that there's a lot of people where, you know, yeah, you're worried about what your parents are going to think. You mentioned it. You had so many people saying, well, you're going to have the scarlet letter on you. You're going to be a loser. Like, how are you going to clean it up? Yeah. Like, how does one at 16 years old make that decision and then ultimately go out and execute on it. Well, that's interesting. I, I think the answers to everything are available. I mean, now they're available on the internet. It's even yeah. easier. But back then, the answers are general, generally available if you open your eyes. So what do I mean by that? They're, they're, uh, my mother had actually gotten her GED, and she was really smart and had tried to overcome her health issues by getting an education late in life. She was brilliant. And so I watched that play out. Um, but then that's what gave me the epiphany. Well, you got your GED when you were 38 years old and went right. to college. I was like, well, I wonder if there's a loophole where I can get my GD and go before all these other kids graduate. Because yeah. this seems like an utter waste of time, considering yeah. that I am living dirt poor on the st- you know, yeah. on the mattress yeah. and working at McDonald's and in an overnight deli. Like, relatively speaking, I need to accelerate the situation. Right. Uh, and that's how I came up with the idea that, sure enough, there was a loophole. If you had your GD, they didn't care what what age. They didn't care if your class had graduated. They seemed, they changed that, by the way. I'm yeah. quite proud of that. I feel like that's my rule. Yeah. But at the time, yeah. you know, uh, you could. So what's the point of that? Um, The answer was out there, which is if you wanted to take this drastic step under the circumstances, you can make a move. Now, if you're going to submit to conventional wisdom because everybody tells you this is how you're supposed to do it, um, you can. But the problem is people don't have context. I never let anybody into my home. No one ever knew the true way in which I was living my life. So if I had taken that advice from the guidance counselor or the teacher – you know, I'd be basically substituting my judgment for theirs. Right. And I always tell people all the time, like people, Gary says the same thing. People don't have all the facts. So I, I know I was 16, maybe I was a little scrappier than than typical, but I believe everybody has inside of themselves the ability to look around, follow the patterns and trust your intuition and your own judgment. We just, there's a whole cottage industry about outsourcing your judgment to all these other people, books built to last, you know, uh, you know, good, good to great, and everything. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And it's not about those books. It's just generally we 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 spend too much emphasis on outsourcing our own judgment to other people, as opposed to refining our own pattern recognition and our our own intuition. Like, did you know that that's what it was? Like, when you look at pattern recognition, or at least uh, self awareness, or you know, wh- whatever you want to call it. Yeah. 
did you did you know what what that was or you're just kind of no like, that you one know, was a I tough one that, i have to say like that i say that now it's so neat, neat and tidy yeah, right yeah, made the decision. You know like i worked out and now yeah. i'm sitting in this office <laughs> yeah, it's like, and there was nothing in between no heartbreak no dysfunction <laughs> yeah, yeah it all you know, smooth sailing yeah, i'm yeah. skipping over the fact that i was at seven years of college you know <laughs> yeah. just dancing on, on the edge yeah. you know what no no you're um, the van wilder i know so the answer is probably no but uh, I had the exigent circumstance yeah. that required me to uh, look at the situation from a different perspective. I did have a lot of confidence. I felt like this wasn't meant to be my destiny. I was like, why am I going to let an accident of birth and circumstances define the rest of my life? Right. Also, my mother was just getting worse and you could forecast out like this is not going to end well. And I used to have these intimate conversations with her saying, like, what are we going to do? There's no cavalry. Like we're going to the emergency room because you have no insurance. Yeah. Like I'm like it's just it's just going to end terribly. Yeah. Um. So, but when I sat on the steps after dropping out that day, which was one of the most humiliating days of my life, you had to go return each textbook to your class, and oh. I t- turned mine unopened, you know, all nice and yeah. impressed. And I remember walking into my science teacher. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again and again until I die, probably. But uh, <laughs> hand him the book, and he looks up at me. He goes, you know, oh Higgins, what a waste. You know, I'll see you at McDonald's. No exaggeration. I remember I'm about to walk out, turn around and said, you know what? If you see me at McDonald's, it's because I bought it. Right. And then I was like, he's probably right. <laughs> I'm yeah. probably going to spend my life at McDonald's. <laughs> and I remember sitting on the steps, you know, packed some, I don't know if kids still pack yeah. buds or whatever. Yeah. I spoke, smoked some Marlboros and I thought like, I may have just thrown my life away. And because no one has pure confidence, especially at that point in your life. Right. There is some self-doubt. Of course, a ton of self-doubt. But that's why there's such, I always go back to that moment in time because it's such utility. So and it's almost like muscle memory. Yeah. The first time that I flexed that intuition muscle and up against all the conventional thinking in the world and I was right. Yeah. Um, and well, I was able to clean build. it up. Then now every time I face that moment of doubt where I'm like holler, horrified, like, what are you doing? I remember back, you know what? No one would have thought that made sense. And, yeah. and I was right. So I tell young people all the time, find that first opportunity for you to buck conventional wisdom and prove that your intuition is correct. Yeah. And then it just, it becomes addictive. Like, you know, I, I not that you want to kind of act like you got a you know, chip on your shoulder all the time right. and just defy everybody. You know, <laughs> I'm a little bit defiant, but it is helpful to have that first opportunity. But at the moment, no, the answer is I was quite shaky with that decision. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, it seemed to have worked out. Worked so. Out. From there, seven years it took you? So I go to college uh, seven years and day and night through all the dysfunction and hardship. Um, but I finally graduated with a BA in political science. And part of the vision I had on the steps of Cardoza was you're going to need to do something that outshines this decision because you are going to be judged for dropping out. Right. Right. And I said, the best way for me to do that is to go to law school. Um, I, I got into Fordham Law. I did really well. I was on Fordham Law Review. And I basically, four years of Fordham and while working for the mayor's office in the day, yeah. doing that at night, taking care of my mother. Um, and then as soon as I graduated and got ready for my career in law school, I walked away from it all and never even practiced, never even took the bar. <laughs> I actually know a lot of people that have done that. Yeah, well, that's, it. you know, what? I, 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 <laughs> for me, it was, it was important to like to really close the door to that path. I just decided, <laughs> I mean, I had no, nothing wrong with lawyers. My brother's a lawyer, went to law school together, but I just really didn't want that to be my life. I just... Feel like it's, it's a hard career, and and it didn't didn't feel like it made sense for me. Right. So I just figured if I never take the bar exam, I'll I'll, I'll never be able to do it. Yeah. And, and there I, you go. That so was, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. one way to do it. One way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Close the door. Uh, so you know, from there, you, you mentioned you worked in the mayor's office. You're also youngest press secretary. Yep. I yep. recall here in New York City. So how does one come about that job? Well, I um during the while I was in college, I worked for the city of New York and I had a column called the Action Desk. It sounds ridiculous now, but it was called the Trib Action Desk. Okay. And I people would send me their problems, a lot of mundane problems, and I would run around my Nissan Maxima all over Queens with the radiator ready radiator leaking. Uh, and I would run profiles on people's problems and oftentimes little problems would become big problems or there was a big story behind them and I won a bunch of different journalism awards for investigative reporting and community reporting. And uh, I was featured in the Daily so you're News. you're like your own Tom Brokaw. Here. No, I like, was. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, that's why I gave you the <laughs> Nissan Max. Which play, you know, we're talking about potholes and car crashes, but nonetheless. But some of the stuff was picked up yeah. by New York media outlets. And then the Daily News had this uh, little weekend paper, and they did a profile on me, and it said, you know, Matt Higgins, uh, a real action hero. You know? <laughs> and I was standing on some contraption in the middle of a lake cleaning algae or something like that. Um, but I came to the attention of the mayor's office, and I got a job um, very young. I was like 21, 22, I can't remember. 
uh, working in the mayor's press office as a young kid doing uh, clips at the time, literally cutting newspapers and then at 5.30 in the morning and taping them to a eight by 11 pieces of paper and handing them out. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, that was my first, uh, you know, big boy job. Oh, very nice. And then I worked my way up a couple of times. And it's another thing I talk about often. Um, I felt like I was my, the job I was really doing was very different than the one I had in paper. And I wanted a promotion. Yeah. I wanted to become deputy press secretary. And I was like 12 years old and they yeah. were saying, you know, be patient, <laughs> yeah. young, young man. Your time will come. Your time will come. And I was like, <laughs> hell with that. So I quit. Uh, and then four months later, they offered. They gave me the job as deputy press secretary. Ah, there you go. Yeah. So quit again <laughs> a year later, <laughs> yeah. and they brought me back as press secretary. Oh, that's it. Actually, yeah. very interesting. So yeah. you know, when you look at that path, was this was this kind of a, a path that you had in mind when you were looking at it, going down, you know, press secretary? Because it's quite a transition when you look at going from deputy press secretary, press secretary, and then. Now running, you know, RSC. <laughs> well, I think I think people put too much pressure on themselves to know what the ultimate destination is, yeah. As opposed to focusing on making the next best decision that's moving in the general direction of your ambition, right? Right. That's a mouthful. But um, and for me, I would just say, okay, what's my number one skill set, and what's what's the what's going to get me, you know, out of this situation? Because remember, I, from age sixteen to twenty six, my we were dirt poor, zero money, and my mother was getting uh, progressively worse uh, health wise. And so the early skill set I had was communication. I was a great writer. Yeah. And that's how I got the first job at the newspaper. So it was about, all right, how do I leverage this job as a writer in communications to get the best possible job I can get at that age? And um, for in those early years, it was all about press and communication and media and pattern recognition. And I combined those. And uh, that was the best I could do at that moment in time. And I had a, a love and passion for, for government. So if you look at my entire career, it's really just a series of connecting the dots from the thing that came before right. to get me closer to my ultimate destination. And um, the days are like when you need to decide I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer are kind of over right. unless you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, yeah, which is great. Um, but really otherwise just make the next best decision in the general direction you want to head in. So for me, that's how I started there. I always hoped and thought or had suspected I would end up in some kind of environment like this, building things, building companies. Um, and so from those first days, I started hustling, selling flowers. Like, wait a second. So we're wholesaling these flowers for like five bucks, selling for 15, and I'm only making like two bucks. Yeah. I'm on the wrong side of yeah. this. How do I get how do, how do I go to from labor to ownership? Yeah, yeah. So this has all been an attempt to transition from labor to ownership. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So what, what was kind of your first foray into ownership? Uh, I partnered up with Steve Ross uh, with, on just a general idea. But sorry, okay, you, you okay, like gloss over, over that. Everything. It's like, yeah, this yeah, guy, yeah, Steve yeah, this Ross, Steve I don't know Steve if you've Ross, heard of him. Yeah. You know, I just, well, like, well, okay, well, yeah. I'll, I'll, connect, I'll connect the dots in, <laughs> yeah. in, in, in 60 seconds. Over, there we right? go, so, I love it. So I'm, uh, so I'm going to Fordham Cliff all night, <laughs> and I'm working, uh, I'm working for the mayor's office. I've become press secretary after September 11th. Um, I transitioned and became one of the first employees of a new federal agency charged with rebuilding the trade center site. Yeah, okay. And during those two years, the most complicated, um, you know, gut wrenching project in probably U.S. Yeah. history, uh, on the ground every day, ground zero, working with the families, working with the different constituencies to try to put the pieces of our city back together again. Um, I just learned a lot about development and how to reconcile all those moving parts and try to keep moving in the right direction. And there's just tons of anguish and pain right. and. Um, did uh, that for two years and decided once we had a memorial and a plan in place, I was going to transition to the private sector. It was just so, so gut wrenching yeah, and emotionally, And draining. I had been doing it for years and years and seven days a week. So how do I use those skills in the private sector? The New York Jets uh, were looking for somebody to help them build a new, camp, a new stadium on the West side, <laughs> which wasn't hugely popular. So uh, because of my background yeah. in media and development. Enter Matt Higgins. <laughs> yeah, enter Matt Higgins. If we fight the an epic uh, land use battle uh, against Cablevision actually was the, uh, was the antagonist on the other side. Yeah. Um, and uh, ultimately after years, we were unsuccessful and I helped put together a plan for the Jets to build a new stadium and a new practice facility in New Jersey. Okay. So, so over the course of those eight years, more and more different jobs and leadership until ultimately I ran the business job, uh, operations of the New York Jets, which taught me business, sales, marketing, communications, land use, and all those skills. I mean, it, you didn't stop there though, because no, to, to most, there. I mean, to be able to be in front office managing a NFL an NFL team, that sounds like it's funny a, you said that, a dream that, job. That was it's funny you said that. That's <laughs> exactly, you know, that was my dilemma. I, I had an office sitting on the 50 yard line, <laughs> you know, of our practice facility, beautiful office, and thought, okay. I could do this job forever. It's yeah. everybody's dream job. But if I'm honest with myself, it's everybody's dream job but my own. Yeah. And I really am committed to not assess my own 
desires and needs based upon the feedback I get from others, right? right. Like you walk around, it's pretty cool. Like yeah. you're, you know, oh, man, you're hanging out with Rex Ryan, going to get a snack. And, like, <laughs> um, and I just thought, if I don't make the move early on, it's just too seductive. I'll end up making this my life, and it's an amazing life. It's just right, the Jets have been regretting that forever. Uh, right, right. Well, so. I was going to say, for <laughs> and they shall. No, just, had they had you uh, still, yeah, you they know. would all be fine, right? Because I was so good at putting yeah. together a winning team. Uh, but my job is purely business, and and again, that's one of the things I talk to people about all the time. Never judge your decisions based upon the feedback you get from others. Like it's great that they're enamored and infatuated with your life, but yeah. you still have to live it. Yeah. And I just felt that my my destiny was to build things, build companies in the, in the commercial sector. And so how do I make that pot, that transition? Yeah. And I was going to go out on my own and, uh, I had announced that I was leaving the team and Steve uh, Ross was probably in his third year of ownership and things were, you know, shaky at the time. He needed some, some help, wonderful visionary, brilliant, creative mind. And, uh, we just forged a partnership where I would help oversee the dolphins, um, and help put in place the right leadership team. Uh, and at the same time, we would build companies around it. Yeah. What does that mean? It was like, you know, <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll pretend that there was a, you know, a big business plan or whatnot, <laughs> but it was a very loose idea. But we just went to work together building and version 1.1 was incubating companies. Yeah. And, you know, 2.1, 2.0, 3.0, it began to iterate and evolve. Um, but one of the first deals I ever did was Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah. And I remember having a conversation with Steve about this crazy guy named Gary, you know, he's got a wine store and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and who, um, who him and his brother, AJ created this incredible social media firm. Logic being, if you could have a social media digital army behind you, oh, yeah, no matter you what can, you end up doing, it's a platform. For it's going to work, right? Like it doesn't take rocket science to figure out like that might be a good idea. But do you think that that was like an affinity that you've had towards communications and media and a just bit. the next well, iteration? Well, that's of? funny you say that because you always do what you're most comfortable doing, right? right? So if you look at the first deals I ever did at R at RSC, it's uh, become partners with Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, incubated a P uh, PR communications firm with Jesse Darris, yeah. which has become one of the leading uh, br communication brands in direct-to-consumer businesses. But that was the second thing. We we launched right. our own firm. Now we have 100 employees. Yeah. Gary has 1,000 employees. Yeah. Uh, we and created an international soccer tournament in sports and entertainment. So, yeah. But that's, again, you always you want to build a bridge to your future self. Yeah. And it, like we don't need to shun our past self. Yeah, you yeah. just need to have a vision about where you'd ultimately like to end up. So. And then uh, the second thing is I believe in this. Every day I ask, what's the highest and best use of my time and energy today? And if you have a growth mindset, that's different than the answer was yesterday. Yeah. And so I, the I, way I audit my decision making is I ask myself that every single day, maybe you know every week, but but it's you always have to reassess that question. So version 1.0 was the things I was most comfortable with. Right. And, then and now people are like, what is it? What does restaurants have to do yeah. with you know Gary Vaynerchuk? I'm like, the answer is nothing. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was I've kind of the point. <laughs> I've, evol I've evolved. Yeah. Yeah, right. And uh, so here we are now. So, so you, you've now moved into multiple different industries. Uh, yeah. And I so St Steve has a, a, you know, a strong viewpoint, which I've adopted because he's right, is that you want to connect the dots, that you don't want to move too far afield from that which you know, but you also should feel comfortable to leverage what you've been exposed to yeah. to seek bigger opportunities, right? Like you don't need to pigeonhole yourself. And uh, if you look at the restaurant industry, for example, um, the, these com these concepts that are founder driven and are magical in some special way that suddenly generate a lot of heat. A lot of them topple over when it comes to real estate decisions. Yeah, right. Well, it's they, usually they, like, or, the, or, or scale. Yeah. They don't have the infrastructure or the support, and uh, there's not a lot, a ton of money being thrown at the industry in those early days, right? If you have a hundred units, you could raise money yeah. from a lot of people, but if you only have twenty units or ten units, uh, it's just a different marketplace. And so we we saw an opportunity if we could back some of these amazing founders and provide our infrastructure, we could help them scale, make the difference, and get involved early. And I just love the hospitality space and the food space. Yeah, it's like you're dealing with a combination of art but also business at the same time. Yeah. And it's really hard. Yeah. yeah. Which, uh, which creates its own moat, right? Yeah, you, yeah. well, you can tell because you've had some unique dining experiences recently. Uh, I've, oh, yeah, it was in Noma in Copenhagen. A little That's, plug for uh, that, yeah. which is pretty amazing. Yeah, the, that place, uh, it's one of the, you know, top places to go try and eat. Can I know. You, can I you like, talk about that one? I know we're veering off track a No, little we can bit, veer but, off that. But it's, so, it's so interesting. Well, so <laughs> this know, is, a, a, well, well, well uh, bees I love, and, bees. Yeah. I love talking about this topic yeah. because, uh, well, for one, I travel all over the world pretty frequently and, and um, oftentimes my wife comes meet meets me. Yeah. She's my best friend, and uh, I like to fit in little micro vacations. 
Another so, plug. For yeah, this yeah, I good. right. This is two. Uh, three is the objective. So <laughs> exactly. just, uh, but I'll do it organically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but we get in little micro vacations wherever we go, and so I had to go. I had to be in. Um, I had to be in uh, Slovenia. Yeah. And the airports in L- Ljubljana. So I was like, all right, what, 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 uh, what, what countries have direct flights from Ljubljana? Yeah. And Copenhagen is on it now. Copenhagen, as those who know, know is one of the most yeah. incredible food it's scenes in amazing. the world. Amazing, amazing, right? So I said, can I hit two of the top five top restaurants in the world in a 24 hour period. So <laughs> was able to get into geranium, uh, well, the first night. And then, you know, about 14 hours later was in, uh, was in, was in Noma. Wait, which do you prefer? They're both incredible for their own reasons. Noma probably doesn't exist anywhere on, on the earth. I mean, I've never been. So can you give a little context for those that don't yeah, know? For those who Noma, don't. So, yeah. so, so, you know, uh, Noma was just named uh, the second best restaurant in the yeah, world. In the world, in the yeah. world, right? It's in it's in Copenhagen, and the uh, when you first walk into this incredible place on multiple acres, they have their own, you know, uh, they have their own massive garden where they're pulling in all their you know vegetables and so forth. The entire staff stops. And just says like welcome. I don't even know what they said. I wasn't expecting. <laughs> yeah, 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 I hadn't yeah, done yeah. my research. Yeah. I was like, it was just so warm and not pretentious and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and inviting. And probably and a multiple course for me. I'm forgetting. Was it 15 courses of uh, vegetables doing things that I never thought they could possibly do? Right? <laughs> like, like uh, uh, I think I had three mold courses. Mold. Uh, yeah, I've never. So had, you ate mold. No, I ate a mold 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 taco. I can just eat like a little mole, like penicillin. Pill. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. I had a whole. You went thing. all in. Yeah, no, yeah. they're 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 out of their minds with fermentation. They call you the mold boss. Yeah, there, there you go, there you go. But it was it tasted incredibly well, so it's probably the most spectacular meal I've ever had in my life. So if you ever have the uh, privilege of going there, it's worth going. I'm actually Did you have going the back. Bees? And, huh? Did you have the bees? I had the it? bees, which apparently have some kind of great acid that makes it taste great. I don't yeah. know some lemon acid bead, flavor. Yeah. I know, I know, it's not popular. <laughs> yeah. Don't have too many bees. Yeah, you know, yeah. The future of mankind is hanging in the <laughs> yeah, balance. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. Um, but um, I'm go- so they have three seasons. So I'm coming back for a game season in October. Okay, which I said if you want to meet me there, yeah, that's exactly. possible. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, so that I'm definitely so, it. I'm so I was a little shameless plug for micro vacations too, because I just think I, another viewpoint I have is that uh, you know we all we all know we're dying. It's yeah. a topic I think about a lot, um, and uh, you never know which way is going to be your last, which is cliche. But right. I try to do something every single day that would be worthy having done on my last day. And so if I'm away somewhere and I rationalize like, well, I'll get back. Yeah. Chances are I probably won't get back. Yeah. So well, that's, that's a famous last word. Oh, we'll come back next year. I mean, it's not my wife and I, we were traveling. We, where'd we get? Oh, next year we'll come back and go to that right. restaurant. Chance, and it's like chance. four years later, we still right. haven't gone. Because so life I, happens. Because life happens. And that's one of my takeaways. I had cancer uh, when I was pretty young. And uh, it's hard to hold on to all the, all the great lessons that having an illness like that can teach you. Right. But one of the ones I did hold on to was that, uh, you know, on that last, when you think you are dying, that you realize so many of the things you think about just don't hold up to the juxtaposition of imminent death. Right? Yeah. You just, you spend, you're filling your minds with nonsense. Yeah. And the other thing is I had a sense of what would I care about on my last day. And so I hold on to that every and bees day. bees and mold were definitely Bees and mold list. were way <laughs> high up on that yeah, list. No, clearly. That meal would be worthy of having on my, on my last day. There is, there is no question. So anyway, that, that like feeds into my brain, even if it's for like, like I went to the Great Wall of China, right? Yeah. I went there for about 10 minutes. I, yeah. I had a meeting at my, uh, and, uh, and I just, just well, said, car diverted. Time. I was wearing my suit. I was overweight at the time. Yeah. I ran up sweating, dripping as fast as I could ran back. Yeah. Now one should probably spend a day or so, yeah. but at least I saw the great wall. Yeah, you, <laughs> you, know, you, you were there, you saw it. Yeah, if just, I die tomorrow, at least I won't say, damn, I, I never got a chance to go back. <laughs> but do you find that, that trap, I mean, obviously you, you mentioned, you know, survivor of cancer. Do you think that one of those things that was in your mind is there's all these places around the world that you want to go see or things you want to do or experiences you want to have, you know, it, has that, has that change kind of the way that you approach travel yourself and what you're looking for out of travel? Well, yeah, for, for sure. I mean, uh, so this is people, well, what'd you think about, yeah. you know, when you were sitting, I called zero time, right? Yeah. All my thoughts faded away. Like the New York Times section with brownstones didn't matter anymore because there wasn't going to be a brownstone. Yeah. Like all this nonsense, trivial stuff in my brain. Yeah. So then you're like, well, what do you think about? You think about, did I do right by my kids? That's probably the number one thing. And then the second thing is like, damn, I wish I traveled. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I asked during an interview, now I'm screwing this up because I can't ask it again, but I'll share yeah. it with you. I said, I always say to, say to people, if you were to die tomorrow, what's the one thing you would regret having not done? Survey says yeah. 95% travel. So we all walk around all day, one, hoping to be somewhere other than where we are, yeah, yeah. Uh, but two, like yearning to see the world outside of ourselves. And so if that's the case, and by the way, when I was, when I thought I, you know, I didn't know how severe my cancer was, uh, 
that was my second thought. Like, oh, I really wanted to see stuff. Yeah. And you then know? you hadn't seen and it. And I really wanted to be unburdened and not care and not take things so seriously. Yeah. Right? So I don't know. I, I have a little app on my phone called We Croak, and it reminds me five times a day that I'm going to die. People think I'm crazy for that, but it actually is so peaceful. Every time I go off and I read the quote, I'm like, oh, right. It's called care. We It's called We, we Croak? A croak, okay. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. Uh, Bhutan. That's the country. Yeah. The five times a day they remind themselves they're going to die, and they're the happiest people on earth. And so it makes okay, sense. Well, well you we know, go. people that's so morbid, it's like, that's actually the opposite. Because you realize once you're relieved... Once you're aware of your own mortality, nothing holds up against that thought. Yeah, it's just you kind of, you know, I always say, like, don't let stuff live in your head rent free. It's right. Like, you know, right. It's like but, it doesn't, right. doesn't but if, matter. But if you but if you just go to the extreme of things, like, yeah. oh, I mean, I actually am technically dying. I'm yeah. just not sure when. Yeah, no, so it's true. If, if it is at the end of this day, I'm going to be really mad. I worried about that meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was like, like so like, pissed like, about so the meeting. Pissed, so, or that they so, put an extra yeah. Splenda in my latte. So my kids, my kids see when the alarm goes off and they left, they're like, you're insane. You know, like, here, here, children, look at this. Yeah. Another way to articulate that we are in fact dying. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, just letting yeah. you know. But that was one of the things I learned from, again, I'm not some like hero. I've got it all figured out. Yeah. As, as much as I held on to some of the lessons of, of, of potentially uh, dying from cancer, uh, many things I let go, right? Yeah. I, I'm still as intense and Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you revert well, back. Well, you, you can't. Well, yeah, yeah, the yeah, problem is life that, happens. Well, the balance is you have to be vested in the system. Yeah. Right. Like you, you, right, oh, right. So the, so the balance I tried to strike is to live with the same intensity as I did pre-cancer, but to instead of being motivated by fear or anxiety or whatever else or yeah. trauma, I'm motivated by the pursuit of excellence and the full expression of my destiny. Yeah. Right. Because that those can achieve almost the same result. Yeah. But rather than play from weakness with fear, play from strength of just yeah, you're on offense. Yeah, I'm, I'm expressing myself. Yeah. God put me on this earth, gave me these gifts. I'm gonna I'm gonna express myself. Yeah. And then when the time is over, then it's over. So um, has that expression ever led to like bad investments? Or uh, have you always been right? Which part? <laughs> no, no, I have many wrong investments. Which yeah. part? You mean just generally having yeah, that attitude? Yeah, just kind of going to having that attitude. Right? I actually like, think, I think uh, if I can Because it's a healthy balance between like, you know, actually being that carefree, like I'm going to go for it, trust my instinct, what I'm doing, and just completely- Well, we all, I, we, we all, I suppose some people need fear and maybe even anxiety to motivate them, yeah. right? The amygdala needs to be on high alert and like, you yeah, know, just like it's swelling up, run, yeah. you know, yeah, flight. Let's do it. I, 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 I personally perform better and make better decisions when I'm operating from strength and not out of fear. Yeah. I, I, I think adrenaline for me, uh, I end up making worse decisions. So yeah. as I've mellowed out a little bit, and this, believe it or not, this yeah. is mellow, um, that I make better decisions. Yeah. So I would say my early investments decisions were worse. Yeah. The worst decisions I've made, um, though, are when I hedge too much and I was afraid to double down. Yeah. You know this. Yeah, Winners yeah, are really course. hard to come yeah, around. Yeah. I tell people, I warn them all the time, winners are really hard and very rare. Yeah. And uh, if, if you have an, a winner in front of you and your intuition and your judgment and your pattern recognition skills and your data tells you this is a winner – like you need to block out all the distractions and just double down. Yeah. And if you're wrong, the the regret you experience from doing it will be much less than what happens when you missed out. So as yeah. now I'm now I'm in year seven of this, and my track record of playing small in the face of winning is starting to accumulate into yeah. the hundreds of millions. Yeah. That's what I care. That's yeah. starting to make me like Yeah, well it starts that, to get I'm out mad. Of you. Like, yeah, now, now you're like Damn Yeah, it. yeah, you know, smile yeah. direct is IPOing. Uh, you know, I'm not sure when, but pretty soon I'm like, oh, why didn't we go all in? Yeah, it was, my wife's a dentist, so I know all about right, that. Right, you know all about oh, yeah, that, right? Yeah, so know, that's so. when I look at like it was kind of obvious. Yeah. So I'm trying to be more disciplined that when I you know, when I, you know, take emotion out of the equation yeah. and I see things that I've worked on for a long time that are winning like don't don't like go go wide and an inch deep like go yeah. deeper yeah and that's taking me time again steve oftentimes his voice in my head's like oh he did tell me that he said yeah. don't be a grasshopper <laughs> like, oh, what the hell is grasshopper what does that mean you know like, like and i'm like oh grasshopper jumping from thing to thing yeah it's like go deep here yeah, yeah but you learn you know that's why it's so important to ask yourself the question what's the highest and best use of my time and energy because Again, that, that that's a good way to have a governor on the engine. Yeah. That prevents me from making the same mistakes twice, just just more new, you know, new mistakes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Do you find do you find that travel kind of helps shape and expose you to new things that that help with your investments? Yeah, I I I think travel is so, so great on so many levels. One, scientifically, you have to form those new neural connections, right? Because yeah. you're stressed out. Yeah, you, you don't, don't know, know where, where you are. At. It's unfamiliar. <laughs> Even just everything working slightly differently makes you reassess yeah, your you're environment. Not comfortable. Not yeah. comfortable, right? So I love like my remember I had to go to China uh, uh, for working on a deal multiple times and just no translator, no anything. And I just, I just loved it because I yeah. just, you know, everything was upside down yeah. from my perspective. Yeah, right? You got to so, figure it out. So I think travel one's challenging your, your, your brain too. Just being reminded that 
you live in a very myopic universe yeah. that you think that, you know, all the way you do it is superior it's or the, the best only way, way is the it. best way. Yeah. Even New York, like I'm a lifelong New Yorker, so I get to say this, right? Yeah. So, we, you know, we have this tendency to brag. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. You yeah. know, like maybe that's more like if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> like that's a really tough, yeah. you're like maybe we interpreted the yeah, phrase exactly. incorrectly. And I love New York, but you go around the city, there's so much beauty and wonder in London and you yeah. know, Switzerland and, you know, Madrid. So, I think travel's amazing. I just got back from a five-day trip with my son in Ireland. Oh, and awesome. uh, I told him, let's go to the airport. We'll look at any destination in the world that doesn't require a visa. What's a visa, Dad? Just, just pick a yeah. destination and we'll go anywhere you want. And uh, he said, I just want to go back to Ireland. I was like, really? Awesome. Anywhere? We can go yeah. somewhere else. And we just spent you know, six days wandering Ireland together. That's fun. To we, me, with no plan? You just kind of went? Uh, no, we, we put together an itinerary. Oh, okay, okay. He didn't want to do the show up at the airport thing. He's like, yeah. that's good, Dad. Very spontaneous. But yeah. I think I just want to go to Ireland. Yeah, I'm that's like, cute. I was like, like, wouldn't like, it be romantic <laughs> to go somewhere? Yeah, He's just, like, I think this is more about you than me. <laughs> um, but, but shameless plug for Ireland, uh, the most spectacular place. Yeah. I mean, I, I, great I, people there. Oh, my God. Great people. And the color, you know, it's sort of, you think it's a cliche or it's not really true. It's that green. It's that green. Yeah, yeah that's that. <laughs> definitely so, is that. So good. I, travel is an important part of my life. I travel constantly. I think uh, next week, I'll, uh, two weeks, I'll be in Oktoberfest. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. for work, quote yeah, yeah, unquote. Yeah, of course, that's <laughs> in <laughs> September. Of course, <laughs> yeah, <that's> yeah, ex- <laughs> exactly. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's great. So, you know, if you go back, a lot of people are enamored by you know being able to manage or make personnel decisions around a sports team. Uh, you know, oftentimes most people you know, articulate it and, and explain it as though it's managing a company. Do you see similarities in which those that, you know, are managing their teams or even as a manager or an owner or CEO, whatever that may be, similar to managing personnel of a, a professional sports team? Yeah, I think what's, what's interesting, any, any sports organization is almost like two or uh, two organizations operating in one. And there's tons of effort to, to put to bring them together because they both have their um, own differences in culture by necessity. You have the you know, quote unquote sports side, yeah. which includes personnel, admin, and then coaching and players, right? right. And on the other side, you have the business side. That yeah. is some 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 sports. Ex- you know, some some coaches will see it as a necessary evil or an unnecessary evil. Yeah. You know, and then, and then some foster a culture of kind of of you know one team. Um, so I think on the my experience on the on the uh, on the sporting side, at least in football, is it's almost more like a military. Uh, is to a better analogy, yeah. right? It's hierarchical. Um, everyone needs to know their job. Yeah, you have to form form camaraderie. You have to hold everyone together. Yeah, it, the discipline is so important. You're also surrendering your life to it. I have never seen people work harder than in a football context. Like that would oftentimes like I don't want to get sucked into this vortex that you're operating on. Yeah. You know, no, no thanks. You like, stay above the fray. Um, and then on the, on the and on the business side, it's a challenge because you're trying to you know, generate revenue, leverage you know, leverage the, uh, the team and whatnot, but yet it's not the object of the exercise. Yeah. Nobody gets or should get involved in a sports team purely to make money or to make money. Right. You should first get involved because you, you love, you love the game. So I would say military is, is, is okay. more akin to it. Yeah. Yeah. But do you find like similarities that, that seep into things? I know a lot of people talk about team players uh, and, you know, egos. Uh, and, you know, I can imagine like any other industry, whether it's real estate, sports, I mean, media, I anywhere the, there's egos. I think the biggest difference, and it probably, uh, if you don't manage it, it's capable of seeding resentment. When you are uh, even a player or a coach, your job is on display yeah. and your performance is on display every week or in baseball every day, yeah. you know, yeah. so forth. So you don't really have a degree to paper over your mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're in business, like, phew, yeah, you, you know, can, like, oh, you yeah, can rationalize, I, I meant for that company <laughs> yeah. to go to a zero. It's a portfolio theory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, don't worry, yeah. but there is no portfolio. Law of averages. Right, right, right. Law of averages. I'll make it up in volume. Yeah, exactly. You know what yeah. I mean? yeah. like, like, We're chasing volume yeah. this, this quarter. We yeah, hedge that like, risk, yeah. you know. So, you know, when I've been around all these coaches and whatnot, you know, I could actually feel their pain like think about it. i have a family to feed yeah. i've devoted my life to this um, my my performance is being scrutinized yeah and you know my, i could be out of a job you know at you look at the red Sox and they then made a move know, today it's that's not. one of the challenges i remember when i was when, at the jets i had an operational role that was always the challenge was to how to bridge that divide a bit because it's true you know a lot of the, the you know, people on the business side generally are not losing their jobs yeah. you know yeah. based upon Over. performance and actually it's even the opposite you can use bad performance to rationalize why you can't do your job. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's true. so from a cultural standpoint, I think that's really, de- and that requires a degree of empathy. And the second thing is the sacrifices that, uh, that, that coaches make, not just in the NFL everywhere is so tremendous because it's driven by this, you know, 
intense love yeah. of the game. So I think that just differentiates it from, I'm sure people at J and J are really passionate about band-aids, yeah, but it's yeah. just different. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? They're not like all in. It's little, like, I don't I'm think super they're, passionate yeah, I about the band-aids. sleep on this couch and put together the game plan for the band-aid launch. I'm all in. I'm sleeping under my desk for the band-aid. So I have nothing but respect and, and deference to it. Never wanted to be <laughs> part of it because I probably wasn't willing to put the sacrifices in. It's yeah. really, it's really tremendous. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and then now, fortunately, we have an amazing CEO at the Dolphins who runs the uh, runs the team, Tom Garfinkel. So we own the best in the business. So for me, it's great because I don't have any operational role. Yeah, it's really hard to yeah. to maintain that. I, I can only yeah. imagine in the yeah. year on year that's week on week stress week on week, and every the, game yeah. year on. So I just have year. nothing but respect for the people who do it, and uh, and that's why this other thing is. It's so easy to play fantasy GM, like because yeah. you have a TV yeah. and an app. You know, you think <laughs> yeah. you could kind of draw. There's no emotion, you know, yeah. Too. But also, it's like the, uh, the not that not that you can't have a good opinion and yeah. assessment of it remotely, but um, and especially in the NFL, unless you're watching tape and really understand what was meant to happen and yeah. what did happen, it's very hard to do that. So I have a lot, a tremendous respect for the sure volume of work and effort that goes into the preparation uh, yeah, and the and preparation. Everything. Right? I mean, that as I've learned, if anything, I've learned, you know, what the pursuit of excellence looks like from coaches and the amount of preparation and game planning they put into things. That's probably actually more relevant than when you look at it from a business standpoint. It is. That the part is the part that I've been yeah. most, I, I admire most is the level of preparation and discipline. Uh, on the player side, the level of discipline that goes into maintaining your body and your mindset. Yeah, yeah. And then on the coaching side, just the level of, of preparation to, to, in a basically closed system, right? Yeah. Where you're trying to eke out any kind of advantage yeah. when performance is taped and on display, yeah, right? Yeah. So how do you eke out an advantage and the, the the level of planning and preparation and a lot of the things that we do in our business, they, they don't yeah. they don't lend themselves to that level of preparation. Yeah, because you don't have that visibility. I mean, right. you're not watching tape on your competitor, the other media company and seeing right. like, See, everything. What are they, they doing do? yeah. today in there? Oh, but, wait, they're playing soccer in there. It's but like, on yeah, a personal cool. level, I'm sure you felt this too, where you sometimes in life, you strayed from your discipline and you yearn for just a little bit more discipline, a little yeah. bit more parameters. Like, yeah, yeah, like no, hundred percent. Yeah, that part could be tantalizing. Like, I, I would like to eat the same thing every minute. Where, <laughs> yeah, where, where are my egg that, whites? I'll drink, decision. I'll drink my egg whites. Let's remove variables. <laughs> yeah, I won't exactly. drink for a year. I'm gonna know? wear the same shirt yeah, every day. Exactly. It lasts for like a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You make these like, big promises. Like, I can't, I can't stand this shirt. Yeah. So, so I like to immerse myself in it. Be like, oh, I suck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to live a more disciplined life. Or paint your wall gray. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Sarah to do it. Third plug. There you go. We got third, it. Third plug. I lobbed it up for you. It was like, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, one of the more recent announcements you have is this uh, show. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. Shark Tank. You know, what do you? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah, the that show on, yeah, on national TV. Yes, yes. So yes can you ABC. tell us about that? Because you're, you're coming back uh, onto the show. I'm, you know. I'm coming back. Yeah, there's going to be a rematch. No, I, um, I, it's, about, it's always been my favorite show. Yeah. Uh, my son uh, could care less about sports. Yeah. And and we don't not bond over <laughs> yeah. that. I have probably the coolest job in the world for most kids in America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, NFL team, drone racing, if that interests yeah, exactly. you. NASCAR, uh, soccer, fan vision. Right, yeah, any yeah. fan vision, internet, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, soccer. Nope. Um, but we would always bond over business and we watched episodes, you know, through every single one. So that's yeah. a piece of it. And then uh, I just thought, like, wouldn't it be amazing to be on that show? Yeah. As a shark. Yeah. Now, there's no like template or form on the internet. You know, I would like <laughs> yeah, to be like, a shark. Please. How do you apply? How do you apply uh, for yeah. a shark? So I went to Indeed and I went on to yeah, be a shark. Exactly. And I sent a little <laughs> yeah, cover letter. Yeah, yeah, Dear exactly. Sony executives. I, yeah. My name is right, Matt right, Higgins. Right, right, right. I'm a great <laughs> orator. And uh, right. I'm not Mark Cuban. But, <laughs> yeah. um, I just started having conversations with them probably over the course of a year. Yeah. And uh, to them, uh, humbly, they feel like my story represents what the show is about, yeah. coming from nothing and backing entrepreneurs. I do feel like it's what I do in my daytime anyway, yeah. backing hundreds of companies at this point. Yeah. Um, and uh, they gave me a shot to prove myself. So how, do you, how, do, how does one go in and then make a decision kind of just listening to this pitch. I mean, well, that's what's really that? fascinating too. Mark Cuban was making fun of me from what I'm about to say, so I'll say it again. Um, <laughs> it's interesting, anthropologically speaking, about whether or not you can get enough data from yeah. somebody in 60, 60 yeah, minutes well, that's what to I mean. assess like, what, thank you, by the way, because Cuban <laughs> was like, anthropologically. Uh, but no, can you in 60 minutes basically surmise yeah. with some degree of clarity yeah. whether or not this is an <laughs> idea worth investing in and a person worth backing and, by the way, who's telling you the truth? Yeah. Because you'd be surprised what people say. <laughs> I'm not, not surprised really, at yeah, all. Right. That's Wait, why. And I'm always like, but you were on national TV. Like, <laughs> it's taped as a transcript. Like, yeah. so, so? If, if the numbers <laughs> don't match, you know, yeah. like, but, um, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, you, but then you realize, like, going back, we have these. You know, things called tells, right? Little signals, yeah. little indicia of truth and and uh, and clarity. And 
they're not that different when if you had you know 60 minutes versus several hours or several days yeah. you actually kind of get to the heart of it yeah the question is does it align with what was said like what, what would can you share what some of those may be just in a, terms you know, of uh, like tells so like the, you, oh yeah, what yeah. are the tells yeah yeah I, for me one of the major ones i look for uh is simply put no one has all the answers yeah so if somebody is comfortable saying i don't know uh, but here's how I'm attacking it. Yeah. That to me is a major tell of truth, right? Yeah. And confidence. Do you think, so do you, do you think, you know, cause a lot of people have issues just on that point right yeah. there. Just, Hey, I don't know, you know, I'm going to go find out or here's what I think. And I'm going to try and go yeah. after it. Yeah. This because way. they're holding themselves to the wrong standard. I always yeah. say this to, to somebody who's looking for an investment. I'm not judging you about whether you have it all figured out. I'm judging you whether or not I think you have the wherewithal, the propensity, the capacity, the resourcefulness to get the answers to the things you don't have figured out. Right. Now there's certain category of things you should know, yeah. like your numbers, Yeah, of course. but, 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 but there's huge areas that, 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 that that you don't know. So biggest mistake people make is one, either offer up nonsense yeah. or two, they um, quickly take your opinion. Yeah. Oh, that sounds really great. I'll do that. Yeah, I'll change yeah. all the branding. Like, what, do, what, do you, Wait, what do you mean? <laughs> so you have now no conviction. Well, similar. It's also they're, they're, they're interviewing the investors. Right. So, you well, know, that's it's kind what, of, right. It's kind of back and yeah, forth. But yeah. when somebody adopts your opinion and advice is kind of a tell. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's one signal I think I look for above all us. Um, uh, Two, I don't want to go on a rescue mission. Yeah. Like I want an investment naturally. I don't yeah. need a 19th job. Yeah. So I'm looking for signals <laughs> of desperation yeah. or are you looking for me? me or are you unrealistically thinking that the act of partnering with me is going to change everything? Like yeah. that, that, that's grandiose. Well, it's like you're going to be in the business every day. And that's yeah. What or just by on. partnering with a shark, suddenly it's going to transform all your problems overnight. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just, I'm looking, I'm looking for that. Like there for are that. some material business defects that are here. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> like, I can't I fix can't, your broken yeah. business model. Exactly. Right. Like, so there's, a massive hole in your boat. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then three, which is probably number two, uh, looking for signs. Are you going to be easy to work with? Yeah. Like, are you, are you defensive? You know, are you comfortable in your own skin? Yeah. Like the, the, and those are maybe a little bit harder feedback. to get at, but those are more stylistic that you can kind of pick up. So yeah. I think I'm pretty good at pattern recognition and, 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 and assessing those things for better yeah. or worse. So have you, have you, when you were on the show before, did you invest in any of the, the companies? I, I did. I did a, I did a couple of deals. I was back on again. It's taped. Yeah. It'll be on in a few weeks. You can okay. see what I did. See what you did or did didn't do. Right. But it was an amazing uh, it was truly an amazing experience. Yeah. And, and I try to subject myself to pain and discomfort at least once or twice a year in a major <laughs> way. And for me, this is, was a huge reach. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, haven't been on TV before. Yeah, and yeah. It's not like I was comfortable in that environment. Um, so, but, I, but intuitively I knew this is what I do yeah. and I enjoy the show, but I, that was extreme amount of discomfort to subject myself to. The second time was great. Yeah. The second time it was yeah, just it was like, you were at like, ease oh, a little bit. Oh, I got this. Yeah, and I, uh, like, I got, what up, Mark? Yeah. yeah, like, <laughs> yeah but you're right, exactly. What are you? I got this. Hey, Lori. <laughs> but, um, but every year I try to put, make myself very uncomfortable in some new, new situation that yeah. I haven't been in before. Um, yeah. which is just one of my, you know, life philosophies. Yeah. It's so like travel. Yeah, well, well exactly. Travel. You got You have to do Be it. <laughs> you have to do it. Get uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, put yourself in environments that uh, are not your exactly. your day to day. Don't speak the language. Don't try the food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, what is that? I don't yeah. know. I'll try having it. Having horse in Iceland, like mm, well. it's a little strange, but yeah, you, a little you strange. Went with it. Whale, and <laughs> different things <laughs> exactly. like that. So when you look at, uh, you know, a lot of people are commenting on, hey, there has to be a recession coming up. There's an economic downturn. You know, how does an investor or CEO uh, sort of prepare for economic uncertainty? Uh, what, what are some Yeah, it's so hard to see thing. what the guy I heard a different opinion the other day. We're talking more like 2021. Yeah, I, heard that. I heard that actually I mean, this morning. Right, didn't you hear that? Uh, I just, part of this is people feel like this party's got to end. Yeah. Right, there's yeah. anxiety, like yeah. the cycle's gone on a little bit too long, which probably has. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely clear signals now coming out that it's that it's coming, if not imminent, but, yeah. it's, but it's coming. I think uh, number one is you you want to you want to have cash yeah. to be able to weather that, right? Yeah. It sounds like obvious, but... Uh, a lot of our concepts of, are, are raising raising significant amounts of money, yeah, so that you can be able to navigate a correction, yeah, right? And stay afloat because unless going you're on. The incredibly you know strong concepts, like even anything that still has stuff to be worked out, it's going to yeah. be on the wrong side of this. So I think number one is just make sure you have a balance sheet, yeah. to to endure, um, and then make sure you assess your your business. For example. Um, real heavily real estate dependent businesses. If there is a downturn, rents are going to get cheaper, right? Yeah. So that that's an that's an opportunity. So yeah. make sure you're not making these long term commitments that you can't 
take advantage take of, advantage of, of arbitrage kind of, like of the of arbitrage exactly so but i'm not sure what else you can really do except yeah. keep your head down make 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 good decisions yeah, right? yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I think about it too all the time like all right everyone says it's coming what should i be doing but other than making sure you have enough cash to wear to weather it and not get fixed into long-term commitments i don't i don't know how much more one could do you no know, well, you don't know and it's out of your control right so and ideally not- uh, i feel like we have invest in businesses that do well in good times and in bad i mean yeah. pizza for example uh, eat pizza. Oh, oh, well, pizza over indexes yeah. in, in the last recession. Pizza in 2010 had a, had a strong year, and that's uh, because it's cheap eats, cheap and you know. cheap indulgence, yeah. right? Uh, same thing with Bluestone Lane and coffee, right? Bluestone Lane is an affordable indulgence. You still want your you know four dollar flat white, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, ideally, we have a pretty decent portfolio that does well, sports and entertainment, you know, yeah. does well. Yeah, people uh, want to go. Right. See so that. hopefully, hopefully, whatever's coming. Will not be like it was in two thousand eight. Yeah, uh, catastrophic. Uh, hopefully, we're not uh, over our skis to the same extent. Yeah, uh, because that was obviously you know catastrophic. But um, I'm just not sure when it's coming yet, and I don't see as many signals in in, in a business right. Yeah, as consumer spending doesn't seem to be drying up. Or- no, that's a that's a kind of the crazy thing. I mean, the outside in our business, the UK, which is obviously going through their own sort yeah. of uh, Brexit. Ep- yeah, yeah, Brexit's yeah. happening. It's not. Yeah. You just see what's kind of going on there. But outside of that consumers are still spending. They're traveling more than they've ever traveled. This is just from what we see. Right. You don't see the anxiety among uh, the population yeah, generally. People want right? to travel. Or people aren't talking about it like batting down the hatches. No, no, so no. It's more about yeah, People are talking that, oh, it's there, but they're not, it's not changing their spending It's not spending changing their behavior, behavior or life or anything else. Yeah. So, so now, remember in you know 2007, <laughs> yeah. this housing bubble, this can yeah. go on forever. Yeah. Remember all the, yeah. But it doesn't feel that way right now, right? Not, it doesn't feel not, as bubble Not, 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 not bubble <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. no I mean, bubble. there's like, you know, there's fundamentals that I, I believe are just, you know, they're, they're there for a correction. You know, right. when I, well, you have the MBA. So when, why don't you, when, you, mean, like, when you look at some of these things, I think some of these entrepreneurs are a bit delusional. Uh, I think that they're taking in money and just spending it. Like the money's always going to be there. Like yeah. you said, from a cash standpoint, I mean, I would be building cash for a potential right. downturn. Not well, I think one thing that's, it. so I always try to compare things to a uh, 2000, 2000 last dot yeah. com. You know, I, I worked at a dot com in that era. We skipped over that chapter where I did yeah. a company called Cosmo, K O Z M O dot com. Yeah. yeah. Deliver everything to you in under an hour. Huge company, had 10,000 employees. Like, and uh, that stuff will never be relevant. Right, 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 having right, stuff right. delivering to you right, right away. Right, right, Instant never. gratification. Yeah, never, like, no one will ever. That's never, such a bad no idea. No one's ever going to do that again. Yeah. But, but, um, Back then, it was called you know mindshare. That was the thing yeah. you were judged on, not not about whether or not you could make money again or yeah. had any chances. I feel like that's slipping back a little bit into the into yeah. the world. Things yeah. getting funded that have no foreseeable path to make money to yeah. profitability. So that I I feel like that's coming back. But I do think the world got more disciplined. More real businesses are IPOing yeah. as opposed to ones that have no prospect. Yeah. But I'm seeing that slowly. I see things get funded. Like, uh oh, yeah, that might be a canary in the mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, here we go. Yeah, here we one. go. No, that's good. Well, you know, you've you've traveled the world. Uh, you've obviously eaten at some of the world's best restaurants. Mm-hmm. What's on your list? Is, oh. there, is there anywhere you haven't been that you want to go to? Country wise, country wise, oh okay, yeah. so many places. I mean, I, uh, I Japan is very high up on my list. Oh, you haven't been to Japan? I've yeah. not been to Japan, uh, so Japan's I think we're going to try incredible. to check that off in the next. Uh, in the next year, yeah, you don't need a visa there, right? No, so that's again. See, I don't want to have to go your through son the paperwork. There. It's not. I want to. I want to spend some time in the Middle East uh, yeah. this year, which I'm um, hopefully go to a, a cutter and uh, end of the year. Yeah, um, it's a fascinating area. Is it? Have you been to yeah. Beirut? Yeah, no, no, I haven't been. I've been you, in Israel. You have, never to, been to, you have to go to Beirut. Really? If you're in the region, amazing yeah. food, uh, and amazing food. Was the Paris of the Middle East? Right, yeah, it back is. in the back. Yeah, exactly. I think it's still. No, I, fire. Let me put a plug out there. If anybody needs me to speak somewhere in the <laughs> yeah. world, please, in an exotic location, yeah. stranger the better. Uh, you know, Good I'll, food. Yeah, I'll uh, be down. It was like <laughs> anything out there. Um, Wait, without a visa, unless you're pre-planning it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Which I'm willing to do for the for right spe- exotic exactly. locale for a speaking. It's <laughs> yeah. Australia, hitting Australia. I went to Australia uh, two years ago because we had a soccer match at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. So what, what is what is the the attachment to all the soccer here? Well, I have yeah. a big business. Oh, this what, what is, this is the be, attachment yeah, because I mean, the, oh, I soccer should, is I should a, share it with you. Exactly. This is the world's most beloved sport. Um, uh, I'll give you the two-minute version. Yeah. There's a window in the summer where uh, the largest teams in the world control their own calendar, and they're not being dictated by their national association or their you know, country and whatnot, uh, and they can get ready for the season. Historically, they would take the team on the road, like yeah. the Man Uniteds of the world, expose the team to a new audience while getting themselves ready uh, for the season. And they would hold these relatively meaningless matches. Yeah. Uh, and people would come out for them nonetheless to see it. So about seven years ago, uh, my partner and I and 
Charlie Stilitano and our other partners decided, let's organize that window and put together a real tournament and a real brand and take the best teams in the world and bring them around the United States. That's and how the stars. With that's them. how it started. Yeah. So yeah. the stars and the Ronaldos of the world and whatnot. And thus was born the International Champions Cup. Um, and over the years, it's continued to evolve. We have uh, pretty much every major team in the world participating. Uh, Bayern Munich, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Juventus, biggest teams in the world. Yeah, yeah, Juventus, yeah, 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 I've been to Juventus and Yelly and uh, all PSG, these. Uh, yeah, yeah. PSG, exactly. <laughs> AC Milan, you know yeah, them, yeah, right? Yeah, so three them in Italy, all. you know, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. Uh, five in all the EPL, greatest hits. Right? Yeah, you got so, and then we would organize a tournament. And so, what does that mean? We would rent venues around the United States and major cities. We'd put the teams against each other, put them up in hotels, run a massive logistics business. Uh, and then we would sell sponsorship and tickets. So huge, complicated business. Right. And then uh, we expanded it to China. So I operate, you know, at the Bird's Nest uh, in Shanghai, in Nanjing, all over China. I didn't, and then know, we, I didn't know you had that side of it. And then we well. expanded yeah. it to um, Singapore. Uh, we work with the Singapore Tourism. Great to deal with, by the way. Plug yeah. for Singapore. Um, and now all over Europe too. Wembley. Uh, so it could be 20, 25 matches in the summer month. So wow. that, that's the reason why I yeah. get to travel all over the world. Yeah. I end up in Madrid a lot with, you know, Spanish ham and whatnot. And, and you uh, have a lot of soccer. Uh, I have a whole soccer business yeah, behind my there. head. Yeah, yeah it's a mess. I, it's I like, walked through there. It's a, it's, it's a complicated. <laughs> On my way to the loo. It's, a, it's a complicated, complicated business. Yeah, I can only uh, imagine. But, but it's amazing and, yeah. a, and an incredible sport. Right? Yeah, and no. it takes me to these great European cities with, with intr incredible traditions. Do you see a lot of growth domestically here in the U.S.? It's phenomenal growth. I mean, it, and, with, and we're so early in the development of soccer in yeah. the U S and a lot of it really has to do with the ability to get EPL, uh, in the U S yeah. predictably, right. With the TV deal a few years back. Uh, and then also us bringing the team so people, um, can, can see it firsthand, but soccer is, uh, becoming huge and just going to get bigger and bigger. I just, I think it's fascinating. Even, you know, wherever you go in the world, I think the biggest problem, just to say, well, the biggest problem we have in our country and we actually, uh, just filed a lawsuit today. So this is timely, yeah. um, that, you know, the U.S. historically has exported our sports all over the world yeah. and have been welcomed with open arms. Yeah. You know, the NBA the in NFL, China, everything. the NFL Wembley. all over the world. Right. So uh, most Mexico Americans City. would be surprised to hear that the uh, U.S. Soccer Federation, the U.S., won't allow official matches of other countries to be played in the U.S. Are you kidding me? No, no. This is, uh, I know. People tell me, like, that can't be so. No, <laughs> I, they, I would have said no, that they, can't they be cannot so. cannot be so. No, the U.S. Soccer Federation will not allow uh, us to play official matches. So if, you know, Barcelona versus a, a team from Spain wants to play here, yeah. they can't get sanctioned. And That's so, crazy. Um, so we uh, actually just challenged that today. Uh, and uh, it's stifling the development of the sport yeah. for a whole you know, variety of reasons uh, that we're going to try to work through and hopefully come to some kind of accommodation. But it's really unfortunate. So yeah. to me, that's the next level. Yeah. Let's do what's happening in China. I mean, yeah. the irony is <laughs> China is more accommodating. Uh, let's do what's happening in China and so forth and bring those great matches to the U.S. So I think in the next couple of years, putting that dispute aside, you're going to see some of the best teams coming here and, and having and having well, those the, it's matches. Like a, it's like a huge untapped market. That's huge untapped, you, I mean, right. you look at when David Beckham came over here to the LA Galaxy. Right. I mean, and the world, like, is, uh, I mean, that's stating the obvious, yeah. but the you know, national borders are being broken down, not yeah. erected. Democratization. Yeah, democratization yeah. and you know, the free movement of sport and so yeah. forth. So I'm excited about that, but that hasn't even been tapped so yet. So do you have a team? That you, you enjoy? Do I have a team? I mean, I, I you guess have to, theoretically. You have to be Switzerland. You have to be No, Italy. I don't really yeah. have to. I, I'm very close to Real Madrid. Yeah. Um, Real Madrid was Madrid. the first team. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Real Madrid. <laughs> I love Spain. Yeah. And I mean, how, I get to go to Spain. Por supuesto. Like, yeah. exactly. <laughs> we'll have a meeting in the morning with Real Madrid. Yeah. And then we'll go to Barcelona yeah. or Barcelona. Barcelona. And, uh, Barcelona. Yeah. And uh, like, so, you know, life doesn't suck. right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But Real Madrid was the first team that really believed in us and, and, uh, and backed us. So yeah. I have a commitment. But, um, you know, I feel like I get to pick that. I get to pick an EPL team. Right? Yeah. Why, why don't yeah, I? Exactly. Since I'm I mean, a, you, since actually, I'm an you actually get business, the best of I get the best. I get to pick uh, you know, Juventus. Yeah, 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 exactly. I love Juventus. I got Bayern Munich. They're hosting yeah. me for uh, Oktoberfest. Going back <laughs> to my point go. about life not sucking. Yeah. So, so to get those big pretzels. Yeah, exactly. I, can't, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Uh, Watch out, pretzels. Are you a soccer Matt Higgins is coming Are you a football I'm a huge, fan? I'm a say. huge football Who do you, fan. What's your team? Uh, so, I mean, I love Real Madrid. I, lo I like Ronaldo. Are you just saying that because I said it? No, no, no. I actually, I actually, if you, I will prove I'll prove to you. I'm going to send you. I'm going to text you. I don't believe it. it I'm going to text too... you my signed Real Madrid jersey. Okay. So Ronaldo had a, a friend that was friends with uh, his agent. So they were flying back after winning the Champions League. He signed it. And then he actually just passed it back. 
And so really? everybody on the plane was signed it all. And then it's like Concarino, Ronaldo. That's then, pretty cool. You know, that's pretty cool. So yeah, so that that's one of my things. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I was up with Real at the uh, training camp with yeah. uh, Hazard. Uh, yeah, just <laughs> went for go. a little walk with him. You know, you know threw just it up kind on, of see, hey buddy, up how on you Instagram. Do it? Welcome. I don't know. Anybody you know? know this guy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Matt Higgins here. Uh, <laughs> hey Hazard, what are you doing here? Got the little soccer business. Exactly. But but that's back to the big picture of RSC. I mean, I think one of the things that having one one partner who's one of the biggest entrepreneurs entrepreneurs in, in the, the country yeah. in the world is uh just an appetite for complexity yeah like everything we've done not that you know you should be striving for complexity <laughs> yeah. but he's a willingness to do it yeah. that's why hudson yards well you exists. have to have an appetite for yeah, it you have to i mean especially what's great when you get to a certain place in life yeah you have maybe a little more freedom to take those challenges on well so, i mean hudson yards i mean it's mean, I mean, like a you, small product yeah, project, but that, but, that can you speak to that? I mean, it's really starting to take shape now. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, what I what's amazing for me is my you know first chapter, the yeah. previous Jets chapter. Yeah. We were trying to build a stadium on that side, yeah. and I don't know how many people in the world would have taken on that project. To I build. remember when it was it announced. Was a I, I remember was like, there's trains um, running underneath. You know, it's not like, <laughs> yeah, like not, a little project. Go, like, yeah, yeah we got to build a platform over it. <laughs> you know, yeah, small but, thing. but the, pull, pull together all those pieces and take on that risk and the complexity and the condos and the retail and yeah. everything they've done is amazing. I have zero to do with it other than to admire it yeah. and then put all our restaurants in it. <laughs> yeah, you know, restaurants and hotels. Hotels and so yeah. forth. So I, I just, Steve is a, it's amazing what he's been able to pull off. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that project, I remember when I first had my Huh? How are they going to pull this right. one off? But that's one of the great parts about it, our relationship. And people have asked me, for example, Drone Racing League, right? Yeah. We were one of the first entities to back Drone Racing League. And they'd say, well, you know, what was it like when you had your meeting with Steve? Yeah. I said, you know what? Like, it takes like 60 seconds. Like, here's the thesis, yeah. right? It's an emerging sport. People are doing it all over the world. They're racing these drones. It has the trappings of a sport. If we can organize it and and sponsorship and, v and viewership and the CEO has got what it takes to do it. Yeah. It can be something. I actually got an ad for it and saw it. I was like, I didn't know that this is a couple of years back. I'm like, I didn't even know this thing existed. I love you start that, to look the into yeah, it. Yeah, you're like, like, it's pretty cool. Well, it's actually pretty yeah. cool. It's pretty legit. They yeah. just start watching some videos. And, and I love know. those projects when people like Resi was another company that we incubated yeah. here. Yeah. And we first started, people said, oh, you know, you can't take on open table. They're entrenched, yeah. right? I love those projects. Yeah, yeah. you're like, like well, bring it yeah, on, bring yeah. it on, yeah. and you know, fast forward. Amex just acquired Resi. Yeah, like yeah. so. Those Never are heard of Amex. Of, uh, yeah, Never no, it's a big, it's a big. They compete with JP Morgan <laughs> and a few of the other, you know, yeah, Visa, small, uh, small, card. small bank. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff we're able to take on here. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, Matt, you know, I appreciate your time. Uh, very interesting story. Well, Congratulations on all your success. Wait, before we go, yeah. So, what's one? destination travel destination in the world that i should be looking at and uh, i mean have you been through have you been through asia uh, uh, not i mean much. outside of china no 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 yeah i mean you know vietnam i mean that's to to yeah vietnam i mean it's still affordable and there really is some spectacular resorts and you know it's high high end luxury not that expensive it's still affordable hmm. you know in comparison to and you know you you go back for me i always like cities that are still a little raw. There's not a ton of rules that are there, but you know, there, there's some direction within there and you're safe and those sort of things. But you, know, you can dig in and actually go eat at a local's house or you're going there and it's the family who's running the bed and breakfast or the resort, those sort of things to where you, you, it's not just westernized and you know, everything that we're used the to. Vietnam's got that. Yeah. Vietnam's got it. I think, you know, when you go th throughout that entire region, it's yeah. still, still mainly untapped, you know, and you see, Thailand, it's starting to get a bit overrun, you know, with a lot of it. But you still get a, you still get a lot have of. Have you the, been to Myanmar? Or no, I haven't, no, haven't no. been yet. Yeah, but yeah. there's, yeah, I think, I think that that eight, that area is still okay. Uh, good. Right, that's number untapped. One. Under, second, second suggestion. Uh, Africa. Okay. So you know, like, it, where, where about? It, well, I mean, you can go the South Africa route, but uh, you know, when you start to go through the other areas, and you know, we have some friends that are in. Nairobi and other parts of that world that are, you know, it's really kind of interesting. I, I'm hearing people more and more talk about Africa yeah, yeah. travel. I think, I think it's just, you know, people want those experiences. And, you know, when you're, when you're really getting in and delving into these cultures, I mean, you really have to delve in there. I mean, okay. there's not a ton of infrastructure. A lot of it out there is glamping. So, you know, you're, you're going there. And so that's kind of our, as, you know, as you know, sophisticated as that may be, you know, or seem, you still are out there in nature, and you know, you stay true to the roots. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of bad press around. Oh, it's not safe, and those sort of things. I say, well, we were talking about this earlier when we came in. They're like, oh, well, what do you think about this area? I'm like, well, it's like anywhere else. Like you can go get mugged in New York City or in Vegas, you know, where I live. I mean, it's you like can? anywhere. Yeah, 
never happens. Never, you know, we're in America. Never. It's the exactly. safest place in the world. Right. But stuff can happen if you're not smart. You don't understand what you're doing or make do your research before. But so Vietnam and Nairobi. Africa, yeah, mm. Africa, just around the, the whole whole area within that continent okay. and, and Asia. I mean, outside of China and those sort of things, which okay. I think are Good. A little more commercial. Done. So there we go. Yeah, I'll send you a note. No, yeah. Vietnam was high up there. My brother just came back and said, uh, yeah, I had mean, the most spectacular can, time. I can send you some of these. I mean, it's just insane. Really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, All right, Vietnam. Yeah. Vietnam. So there you go. Vietnam. Laos, another one. That's a good Laos, one. Yeah. pretty yeah. awesome. <laughs> Got it. Okay. All right. Sounds right. good. All right, thank well, you for having me. Yeah, I really, thank really you so it. much, and uh, can't wait to watch you uh, on uh, Shark Tank. That's right. Tune in. We will.